Hey, hello, our TNDF, the Nourish and Develop Foundation community. Today, I have Rochelle joining me from A Greener Future. Um, and a greener, I'm going to let her actually tell you about who, what, and where A Greener Future is. Over to you, Rochelle. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have a chat today. Um, so I am Rochelle Byrne. I am the founder and executive director of A Greener Future, which is an environmental nonprofit focused on litter cleanup and waste prevention. And we operate all across Southern Ontario and also have some programs that run across Canada. Wonderful, wonderful. So when I was uh, looking into your organization, the phrase environmental steward, came up quite a bit and I'm hoping that maybe you can give us a little insight as to to what is considered uh, an environmental steward. Yeah, so an environmental steward can mean many things and I think in the context that we use it as an organization, it basically means any person that is taking action to help protect the environment. So, um, and that can happen on many levels. So there's some people that might come out to a litter cleanup and you know that's the extent of, of what they do when, it, when they're thinking like environmental stewardship. But then there's some people that, you know, the environment is one of their, um, you know, core values and something that they think about continuously. So, environmental stewardship is kind of on a spectrum like it can be little day-to-day -day things that you that you do or it can be something that's a little bit more intense and long term um and i mean i think at the end of the day we all have a little bit of environmental steward in us um and what we want to do at a greener future is foster that and help each person grow and um you know even just become more and more sustainable in their everyday lives Wonderful. Thank you. So have you always, um, like to what spectrum or to what degree have you uh, devoted your environmental stewardship? How, how, how was the process for you? Or what was the process for you? Yeah, so I wasn't always an environmentalist. Um, when I was younger, I definitely cared about being outside. I, I liked seeing wildlife and, and trees and that sort of thing. But I definitely wasn't able to like name the species of trees in my backyard or even species of birds for that matter. And it wasn't until I was in my 20s and I took ecosystem management in school that I started to learn about my connection to the environment um, and how every action I took had an environmental impact. Um, so prior to taking environmental sciences, I took fashion marketing and I worked in the fashion industry and um, even through that, like the fashion industry can be very, very wasteful, but being in it, I didn't even actually really recognize that at the time. Um, I worked at a shoe store and I had about 53 pairs of shoes by the time I quit there. So that is definitely not sustainable. And um, now looking back to me, it just seems a little bit silly that I was in that situation and didn't even put two and two together that all of these shoes, um, it takes resources to make them and half of them are just sitting there in my closet. I don't even wear them. So um, there's been a lot of awakenings kind of along um along the way of like developing a greener future because it started out with me doing litter cleanups and at that point i i felt good like i felt like i was doing my part and i was learning but every cleanup i did and everything little piece of information that i learned along the way has definitely helped deepen my environmental stewardship and now 10 years later i I feel like I, you know, like there's always room for improvement, that's for sure. But I feel much better about where I am when it comes to sustainability and being aware of the impact that I have as an individual on the environment. So I think it's a continual process and it's it's something that's you never become an environmental steward and then that's it. Like you're you're there. I think it's something that you can keep building on and learning and um just getting to a place where you feel comfortable with how you're you're showing up in the world and how you know like how you're using resources and having that understanding so it's something that takes time but um 
that's something that with a greener future, we want to help people along and make that journey easier um, by showing them the steps that it takes to get to that next level. Uh, because there's a lot of people that suffer from things like eco-anxiety. And you know, the environment can seem very overwhelming when we think about like climate change and what we can do on an individual level. But by doing all of these little things and kind of taking the small steps, it can add up to a big impact. And I think that can help a lot. Um, and it can, it can change your life. It can definitely help you see the world in a different way. Yeah, I can see that. So A Greener Future was founded how long ago? Back in 2014. Back in 2014. And what are your major initiatives? What are the programs that you run? Your, your, the little movements that, that make a big, bigger impact on a whole. Yeah. So when I first started, it was mainly just litter cleanups and I was doing them in my own community and wherever I traveled to with uh, my other job that I was doing. And it was no secret that litter is a problem everywhere. So it was very easy to kind of expand our, our programs and do cleanups in more areas. And right from the beginning, we have been collecting data on all of the things that we pick up um, for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to track my progress because I had set a goal to pick up a million pieces of litter. So by tracking all the individual pieces, I could see how close I was to that goal. And also to see the composition of what we were picking up because Litter is a very complex problem. And when people think about litter, they think about someone throwing a, like a paper cup on the ground or um, you know a food dropper. But there's a lot more to it than that because there's a lot of debris that ends up in the environment from uh, transport, from storms, from open garbage cans that animals get into windy days when it's garbage day, like there's just so many different factors that we have to put into this. And by collecting that data, we can see what the problem items are and hopefully come up with solutions to help target those items. So one of the first programs that we started, it's called the Butt Blitz, and it is focused on cigarette litter. And that's because cigarette litter is something that we pick up at almost every single cleanup we do. Um, you can literally just walk down your street and you'll probably see at least one cigarette butt. So um, it, it's something that we wanted to focus on because one, it is litter. They're made out of plastic and they contain toxins. They're not just gonna disappear. Um, and all of those toxins and microplastics contained in the filters, they're polluting our environment, they're polluting our water, and a lot of people think, oh, it's just a small cigarette butt, but when there's trillions of them littered around the globe every year, it adds up to quite a substantial amount. So the Butt Blitz basically raises awareness about the fact that cigarette litter is litter and that it is hazardous. And we have volunteers across Canada go out and pick up as much cigarette litter as possible. And um, to date, we've picked up over 3 million cigarette butts through that program off the ground, which is pretty amazing. So it's incredible. Yeah, it's really cool to see the growth of that program and the awareness that's raised. And we still have a long way to go, but um, just, you know, like seeing the progress is really cool. Um, and then our other program is called Love Your Lakes, which is focused mainly on Lake Ontario, but we do want to spread out to the other Great Lakes over time. Um, and we do over 100 litter cleanups each spring and summer along the shorelines and the public can come out. Sometimes we do cleanups with groups. So whether that's um, like community groups like like girl guides or um, school groups or even local businesses. We try and get as many people out as possible and we um, you know, talk about the data collection and see what we're finding and kind of have those important conversations because it wasn't until I started picking up granola bar wrappers off the ground and thinking, hey, that could have been mine, that I put two and two together and thought like, maybe there's another way. Maybe I don't need to buy packaged granola bars. Maybe I can make my own and then there's no packaging to worry about. So it's all about connecting those dots and um, getting people to 
feel good about making these changes. And I think that's, that's exactly what I love your lakes program does is it gets people out. They get to meet people that are like-minded, feel good about the work that they're doing and then inspire further change um, through personal actions. So it's a lot of fun. It's really nice to be out along the shoreline in the spring and summer and just have really good conversations. Yeah, that's wonderful. So the first step is picking it up. What do you do after, after the picking up part? Um, how do you, how do you deal with the trash that you're picking up? Yeah, so we do have partnerships with a lot of the municipalities that we work in. So if there is garbage to be hauled away, the municipality will come and collect it. But before we do that, we try and separate out as much as we can that can actually be reused or recycled. So any bottles or cans that are in good condition, they go into the blue box. Um, we try and recycle textiles through a local textile recycling program. Um, we even recycle the cigarette butts. We send them to a company called TerraCycle and then they recycle them into um, basically plastic lumber. So by diverting as much as we can, we're hoping that we can send less to landfill. Um, and sometimes we find like things that are perfectly good um, that people have dropped. So like whether that's clothing or um, other personal items, if we can't find the owner, then we can donate it. So just I think the diversion part is really important because our landfills are filling up so fast. And um, really like a lot of the stuff, it's, it's resources, it's, it's stuff that could be reused. So um, that's one, one of our, our main concerns is just being able to put things in the right place. That's wonderful. I personally didn't know um, prior to looking into the organization that you could recycle the cigarette butts. Uh, and so is that something that anybody can do like, could they reach out to TerraCycle on their own to have their cigarette butts if they wanted to take on an init that initiative on, on themselves? Yeah, absolutely. Um, TerraCycle is, is pretty easy to work with. You just have to create an account and then you sign up for um, whatever brigade you want to be part of. With the cigarette litter, you do obviously have to be over 19 years old. Um, and it doesn't have to be cigarettes picked up off the ground it could be if, if you're a smoker you could um, send in your cigarette butts regularly um, and I, f I find like our experience with the butt blitz and you know like getting people to that level of where they actually want to recycle their cigarette butts if they're not an environmentalist it's it's a lot to ask because they have to save them and then they have to create an account, download a shipping label, drop it off at UPS. That might be something that a lot of people aren't willing to take on um, because it does take extra work. But um, A Greener Future is working on piloting a new program where we can do cigarette recycling in a bunch of different communities across Ontario to make it easier for smokers to actually recycle their cigarette butts. So um, the, the goal would be to give each smoker a, uh, a bucket, they fill it, and then they call one of our volunteers, the volunteers will swap that out and then combine all of those butts to send into TerraCycle because there is a, a minimum amount that you have to collect in order to send. So um, we're hoping to relieve some of the burden of like the process off of smokers or even people who want to go out and, and pick up cigarette litter and, and submit it for recycling. Like we can, we can work with those people to get that done. So that's our goal. Like there's no reason why cigarette butts shouldn't be recycled if there is a program to recycle them. Um, they're not really doing any good in the landfill. They're just gonna sit there for thousands of years. So it's nice to have an alternate purpose for something as useless as a cigarette butt. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so are there some other misconceptions or insight that you have into the recycling process? I think we, I know I personally have this false sense of security when I'm, when I'm picking up a plastic item, like, oh, it's okay, I'll be able to recycle it. Uh, do you have any advice or any insight around recycling itself? 
Yeah, I think it does give people a lot of false hope because not everything that's put into the blue bin is actually recycled. A lot of it does end up going to the landfill um, for a few reasons. One is because every municipality right now is different and they accept different things. And just because something has a recycling symbol on it doesn't mean it's accepted in your municipality. If there's no recycling symbol on the, the piece of plastic or glass or whatever, then it might not even be recycled because it's that recycling symbol that tells um, like the, the staff at the recycling plant what type of plastic it is and where it needs to go. So if they don't know what it is, then it's probably gonna end up going to the landfill. Um, on top of that, there has to be buyers for these, these end products. So like all of this waste that's collected, when you look at those recycling numbers, number one plastic is the most recyclable. So that's probably a lot easier to sell. But if you look at like styrofoam, for example, it doesn't recycle well and it doesn't have a lot of value. So it's harder to find buyers for that type of material. So it's more likely to end up in the landfill rather than actually being sold. It's actually cheaper to make, like to purchase new plastic to make materials than it is to recycle styrofoam. So there's, a, it's a very complex process and there's a lot of resources that are used to actually recycle things. So it's not, it's not as good of a solution as what some people might think. Um, and there's a lot of, definitely a lot of wish cycling that goes on. When I walk down my street on recycling day, I see things like furnace filters in the blue bin and you know things like that, they're just not recyclable. So all of that stuff, it has the potential to actually contaminate the recycling stream. And then if, there, if a whole lot is contaminated, they just throw it all out. So, Yes, unfortunately, not everything is recycled properly or recycled at all. So I think the first thing that I think about when I'm going shopping is not necessarily like it can be difficult because what's available is what's available. So when I'm shopping, I'm looking for less packaging or no packaging. And if I do have to buy something in packaging, I'm looking for it either in cardboard that can be recycled or in number one plastic, because then at least it has a pretty good chance of being recycled. But it is, it is tricky. And I do hope that there are improvements made with the recycling system over time, because it definitely does need some work. Are there some initiatives going on um, to help kind of bring uh, awareness and encourage change at a government level? Um, it really, it really comes down to municipalities, um, and some do it better than others. And unfortunately, I think it's just it comes down to what the priorities are in the community and um, who's, who's in power too and what their priorities are. So I think at the end of the day, like individual action is really important um, and we need to be able to su support our communities, our municipalities and make those changes happen. Um, I've seen a ton of very successful projects happen in different cities and it's not usually the government that is is putting them together. They might they might um, have government support, but the government isn't always interested in taking on these bigger challenges. Um, you know, it's a lot of work, and you know the the governments they there's a lot of turnover sometimes. Um, you know, funding can be very up and down. So it's and it, it takes a lot of time for change within the government. So. Uh, I, I don't like to wait around for that kind of change. So I like to focus more on like the individual efforts and what we can do as a community as opposed to waiting for the government to take action. Um, but we should all be um, definitely using our voices and voting to make sure that we, we can get the right people in power to make the right decisions. So it's, it's a big process, but um, I wouldn't say it's, you know, like the government isn't doing anything. They definitely are, um, mm -hmm. but it is just a, a much slower process. Okay. Okay. So you yourself have moved towards a um, low waste, zero waste 
day-to-day -day living. Uh, so you're, the advice that you've given us thus far is looking for little to no packaging, cardboard packaging, or the recyclable number one. Do you have any kind of tips um, that we can, we can take into our day-to-day -day life to reduce our waste? Yeah, I, the hardest part of this is just changing habits. Um, and that's something that you have to take one step at a time. And I'd say just making one change at a time is the best way to do it so that it doesn't get overwhelming. So if you haven't already, um, start reuse, using reusable bags at the grocery store. That's probably the easiest thing. And it, the first few times you'll definitely forget them, but eventually you'll start remembering and then it will become second nature. I, every time I unload the groceries, I grab my bags and I take them to the car Put them in right away so i know that they're in there and if i go into the store and i forgot them in the car i'll go back out and get them um so it's just training yourself to keep um thinking about like the planning process like what do i need to do to make sure i don't forget um the other thing is using a reusable water bottle or um a reusable travel mug and i used to buy tea all the time from like starbucks or tim hortons or a coffee shop and um, that's a lot of paper cups that add up over time. So by reusing my own reusable cup, I'm saving all of that waste and Tim Hortons and Starbucks will give you a discount on your drink as well. Um, and I, I make tea at home a lot and I, I use loose leaf tea. You can uh, fill up on loose leaf tea at Bulk Barn with your own container. So you don't have to have any packaging. Um, and you, I use a tea ball and I just, fill it with the loose leaf and then brew my own tea and then I compost the tea leaves. So um, it's it's just looking at the areas of your life where you create waste and all you have to do is look in your garbage can and see what's in there and then trying to figure out what can I do instead. And I'd say like, just do it one thing at a time. So like look in your garbage can, see something that's in there, make a change to something that's more sustainable. It doesn't have to necessarily be zero waste. It could be just a step in the greener direction. Um, and you know, if it's something that you can't live without, then pick something else. Um, you don't have to start with the hardest parts. Uh, and I think that's, that's the most important thing is just like, the small changes over time uh, really do add up. And now, um, like, I don't feel like I'm compromising my life in any way in the way that I'm living. Um, I think it's like, it's not a challenge to me anymore. Like at times when you have to like find those solutions, um, it can be tricky. You have to do a lot of Googling. There's unfortunately, there's not accessibility everywhere when it comes to buying sustainable products. Um, I live in the GTA, so there's lots of zero waste shops. There's like we do have bulk barn. We have lots of farmers markets where we I can take my bags and just get the fruits and veggies without packaging. So and I know that's not the case for everyone. So it's it can be tricky, but um, it's it's really cool to feel like the changes in your life and the progress that you're making um, over time. And it saves, a, it can save a lot of money too, because I definitely buy a lot less now than I used to. Um, I'm buying better quality things and I'm, there's a lot of things that I just, I can live without them. I don't need them and I don't miss them. So mm -hmm. I think that's another big thing is just buying less. If we don't need it, um, it, it's nice to be able to save money that way. <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, you talked about uh, textile waste. Um, and I mean, we, we've been hearing a lot about fast fashion. <laughs> um, and in your cleanups, are you, you are seeing a lot of textile waste during your pickups? Yeah, sometimes it's just clothing items that people have, have dropped. Um, Sometimes it's more of like construction materials. So things like tarps or um, even like, there's like fabric type stuff that's used in construction. Um, so yes, I'd say like textiles aren't a huge portion of what we pick up, but they're definitely out there. I think the biggest problem with textiles is that a lot of people send them to landfill um, just by like throwing them in the garbage. Like when, if you wear a hole in your sock, where do you put it? Most people would just throw it in the garbage. Um, but there is textile recycling around. 
you just have to kind of hunt it down because it's, it is, it's harder to find, but it is available. Um, so yeah, it's tricky. It is tricky. So we're in the Durham, Durham region. Is there an area in the, in, in Durham that recycles yeah. textiles? Yes, Oshawa has textile recycling and it's basically at all their community centers. They have a big um, bin outside that you can put your textiles in as well as Markham. Um, so those are probably the two closest areas that, that do textile recycling regularly. Um, but I know like a quick internet search might turn up um, other opportunities that are, that are closer too. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So what would you consider, we've talked about textiles, we've talked about cigarette butts. Is there another big culprit that you, you see on your cleanups? I'd say like the, the other thing that we pick up most is plastic pieces. And that can be from anything, whether it's, um, you know, like a broken pylon or a piece of a shoe, like everything is, seems to be made of plastic these days. Um, so I think just the main thing is just try and look for alternatives to plastic when possible, and especially single use plastics, because we do still find a lot of utensils and straws and um, even like single use plastic cups and that sort of thing out in the environment. And that's something that's very easy to change. Um, mm -hmm. Even by bringing a, like a, a little zero waste kit with you, if you have a backpack or a purse or even a car, you can put some utensils in a little um, bag and then you always have that with you. Um, and, you know, like it does make a big difference over time because you can only imagine how many um, like utensils or straws are given out at any given restaurant every single day. Um, and it's nice to see that a lot have changed to paper straws or, um, you know, like even bamboo utensils, but not all of them have yet. So I think just, it, it takes time. And especially for businesses, like there is a price increase if you're buying more sustainable products. And with the pandemic, it's already been so difficult for so many businesses that it can be a real stretch for them to make that change. So I think by individuals, like we can help support those businesses by using our own utensils. Like we, we don't need plastic ones. <laughs> so it saves the business money because they don't have to buy them. And um, it saves the environment because they're not ending up in the environment. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the pandemic. Did your organization see, um, how, how did your organization, how was your organization affected by the pandemic? Yeah, um, at the beginning, it was really tough because we had to cancel all of our public events. We couldn't meet at all um, in person. And we had planned to do over 100 litter cleanups. So we had to pivot pretty quickly and come up with new ways to um, work with our volunteers and, and, you know, like connect with our supporters. And we did do it. We ended up making it work. We made some of our programs more remote. So we would do online training, get the equipment to the people, then they can go out and do cleanups on their own. Not as fun, but um, still an opportunity to actually make an impact during a time where there was really nothing else to do. Um, so we actually saw a huge increase in the number of volunteers that we had that were um, interested in, in taking part because there really wasn't anything else to do at that time. Um, so it was, it was really cool because it was nice that even though we couldn't get together in person, we were able to host Zoom calls and, and run our programs and see that impact even though we were all doing it remotely. Um, so I'd say like it was definitely a challenge, but we, we learned and we grew and I think now we're even stronger than before. Wonderful. So is this your season for cleanups? What, what do you have going on or what, what is in the horizon for a greener future? Yeah, so right now we are in the, at the beginning part of our Lovely Lakes program. It runs from May all the way up till September. So we have over probably close to 200 uh, cleanups planned. Um, and we started in the Niagara region. We've picked up almost 30,000 pieces in just over a week. So it's 
it's pretty cool to see those numbers go up and like to meet all of these volunteers that are coming out. It's a great way for high school students to gain uh, uh, like community volunteer service hours for school. Um, and it's really, it's really nice just to be able to get back out there after like a few years of not being able to do the in-person events. So it's been really fun. That's wonderful. Um, I think that's all the questions that I have for you today, Rochelle. I thank you so much for joining us. Um, and if people want to learn more about the organization, uh, it's very easy to reach out to, to them through their website. That's a, a could, what's the website name? A greenerfuture.ca. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, and I encourage everyone to reach out to Rochelle and join a community cleanup. Thank you. Thank you so much for chatting.